I want to say good afternoon to Mr. Foster. How are you doing, sir? Well, good afternoon, Amaru. Thank you for the invitation. Nice to be here. You very rarely get a chance to speak to someone who has so much knowledge and exceeded expectations. And for me, I guess it always starts to the beginning. Um, like, what was life like for you originally when you grew up in um, Bolton? Was it Bolton you were born in? I was born in Bolton, indeed, yes. <clears throat> when I, what was life like? Well, I was born in 1935. <laughs> yeah, eight seven, but uh, not born in thirty five, and four years later, nineteen thirty nine, we had World War Two. <clears throat> so, all the lights went out. Everything was dark. You couldn't, you couldn't have lights on. And but you know, both Jeff and myself, we were, we were kids. So, when you're kids, what's different? That's normal. <laughs> so, for me, growing up, uh, World War Two was probably quite normal. I had no fears of it, of course, too young. But we did, uh, we were able to see the effects of bombing on Manchester because we're, Bolton is slightly elevated. And so from our bedroom windows, uh, when, when there was an air raid going on, we could see what was going on in Manchester and you could see the light of the flames and bombs dropping over there. Uh, so growing up, yes, it was 10 before World War II was over and before really education for me started because up till then <clears throat> we had very little education um, all the guys they'd been called up so they were fighting a war so all we had was a few of the women who were teachers but in those days of course women stayed at home women brought up families so there were not many women so there were not many teachers um, <clears throat> We did get a bit, we got a bit in sort of the, uh, the main room of a house where they, we would go and a few kids would go in there and we'd be taught. But, right, so it's 1945 before the war is over and education starts proper and life changed. All of a sudden the lights are on, street lights are on, everything is uh, bright again. And so being brought up uh, in the north of England, both Jeff and I were in the scouting movement, so we enjoyed that. And uh, I went to college. My brother Jeff, he started with the J.W. Foster Company. That's my grandfather's company, which he started in 1895. So it goes way back to them when the family started in sports football. But uh, so Jeff started in the business. I started at 17. By the time I'm 18, both Jeff and myself were called up to do national service, so conscripted for two years. So that was growing up in Bolton. <clears throat> we did the normal things that kids do. Yeah, we, when it snowed, we had, we had sledges, we enjoyed life. And uh, we didn't really know, I'm not really concerned. Our parents must have been concerned. Obviously, there's a war on. But for us, we were just kids. So kicking a ball around was fair enough, not a problem. So I think it's interesting that you said that there wasn't really a war. I mean, you didn't seem, you weren't scared with the war? Or was it, is it because the media isn't what it is now that isn't that powerful to let you know actually what's really the severity of what's going on? Uh, well, you've got to go back to the 1940s. Radio was a rare thing in those days. <laughs> and we, we didn't have the... Uh, social media we have today. We didn't have the media we had. <clears throat> you had newspapers um, and most of that will say that propaganda took over. So we were told the good news. You were never told the real bad news because all you had was a newspaper and a very limited amount of uh, sound on a radio and the radios in those days were quite primitive having to tune them in. So really what we saw was what we knew and uh, we were not influenced by anything, really, the newspapers, as I say. They were told what to print. They were told to print good news. If it was bad news, don't print it. So, so really, uh, we, we were just brought up fairly well insulated, apart from being able to see 10 miles into Manchester, and uh, that was going on. Uh, one or two bombs did drop in Bolton, <coughs> and in fact, one dropped quite near to the J.W. Foster's Olympic Works and actually blew the window in. And so in, 
my father, instead of going in through the door, he just climbed in through the front window <laughs> on that day. And he did bring back a piece of shrapnel from the, from the bomb, and that's obviously what shattered the window, that it gone through the window. And we had that piece of shrapnel for years. I don't know what happened to it, but it was a big piece of chunk of metal. And uh, yeah, so <clears throat> the warriors, yes, they, when you're young, you know, you're insulated from most things. Uh, and until I was 18, Jeff actually was uh, 20, but he had been deferred, so we went at the same time. Both did national service. I was in the RAF, Jeff went to Germany in the army, and he saw Adidas and Puma. So lastly, so you spoke about your grandfather. So in terms of entrepreneurship, which is what we call it today, like did that type of element of him having his own business or setting up business, did that feed into you growing up, or was it totally separate how you guys decided to set up your own? My grandfather. My grandfather, he was born in 1880 but he died in 1933 and I wasn't born until 35. But 15 months after he died, I was born on his birthday. So I took his name. Grandmother insisted. My grandfather was Joseph William, so I was christened Joseph William. So I took his name. Um, but grandfather, you know, we talk about entrepreneurs, we talk about influencers. That guy must have been a genius for, in his day. He knew he knew how to influence. <clears throat> he would give his product to leading athletes. They would win races. They would break world records. In 1904, he had three world records <clears throat> in one race in Glasgow. Uh, Alf Shrub was the guy's name. And he broke three world records in, in a one-hour race. So he had world records. 1908, and in London, grandfather picked up two gold medals. At least athletes weren't in his shoes, picked up two gold medals. His uh, his real belle epoque, his, his century was the 1920s. In 1920s, and we have a letterhead with all the uh, details on, not only football team, but he supplied all the uh, Olympic uh, runners, athletes, at the Antwerp Olympics in 1920. I think when he says that, he's probably talking about all the British athletes. Maybe Commonwealth, I don't know, but those days, uh, the Olympics were just track and field. So much simpler than it is today, you know, just a few athletic events. Um, but also during the 20s, three athletes, um, Harold Abrahams, Lord Burley, and Eric Little, they all won gold medals. And they were all immortalized in the film Chariots of Fire. And I don't know if you know Chariots of Fire, but if you do, they were immortalized in that. So that's my grandfather. That's the sort of business he grew, fantastic. And then for yourself, it's cliche, but how did you start the Reebok brand with your brother? Well, as I say, Jeff and uh, myself, we started with the company and at 18 we went to do national service. <clears throat> Before we went to do national service, we were just teenagers enjoying life, doing the normal thing that teenagers do. And, uh, but going away, you go away for two years, your mother's not there, you've got to make your own bed. You, you know, food isn't the same. You've got to go for your food. It's the, so you're not delivered everything on the plate. And you start to learn how to look after yourself. And um, I did okay because uh, I could play badminton reasonably well in those days. So for most of my two years national service, I was off playing badminton. And that was great, good fun for me. Although my job was radar operating, um, which was controlling fighter planes. Where, and we sell what they call PIs, practice interceptions. Practice interceptions where they got two planes and they had to come together, either head on or from the side. But, so that's, that's what I did when I, when I was working. <laughs> Most of the time, I, I was playing badminton. So, but what, what happened in those two years, we did change and we came back. And we came back to Jed Wu Foster's and we came back to a failing company. The company was just failing. What grandfather had built Great company, lots of uh, um, successes. Uh, in fact, on this same letter that I was talking about, we, we have 96 football and rugby teams that grandfather supplied, both boots and training shoes. And teams like Arsenal, Manchester United, Man City, Liverpool, you name all the big football teams we know in the UK, they all wore Foster's boots. 
in the 1920s, which is incredible. <clears throat> and yet, when Jeff and I came back to Foster's, we didn't supply any of those. We'd lost it to Adidas. Totally lost the football scene to Adidas. And Jeff and I, we tried to persuade, um, first my father, uncle was not interested, and my father said, come on, we've got to do something. You know, we need, we need somebody on the road, we need to do some marketing, we need some new models, some new ideas. We didn't make any difference. And all my father could say to me was, Joe, look, when, you, when your uncle's gone, and when I'm gone, this business is yours, you can do what you want with it. And I'm saying, come on, Dad, you know, we don't want you to go. That, number one, you know, who wants you to go? But number two, this company will be gone long before you. It's going to die. Didn't make any difference. So uh, Jeff and I, with uh, we, we had little option really. We did go to uh, we went to college at night and we to footwork. We learned about making shoes. And okay, we, you know we should know about making shoes. We knew about making running shoes and football boots, but we didn't really know anything about the business. You know how shoes are properly made, the opportunities. But the big thing about that was not only learning but we made a lot of friends we we met a lot of people people in the industry and so when we did leave that was to be that was to prove a, a, a really great help because we wanted a machine to do this a machine things that fostered didn't didn't and more they used very old methods we wanted to get some new methods and so we asked our friends and we were able to buy machinery and set up our our little factory so in 1958, Jeff and I set up our company, Mercury Sports Footwear. And what, at that point, were the challenges you were having in business? Well, the first challenge was that uh, we knew we, we, we needed a future. <laughs> and, and Foster's would not be our future. So that was our first challenge, set up a, a company. Um, the challenges, well, there were a, a number of uh, sports footwear manufacturers in the UK, not a lot, but they were all bigger than we were. <clears throat> and the biggest challenge was the fact that football was, we couldn't go into football. That, that was owned at that point by Adidas. They, it would have taken so much money. So we turned to what we knew and that was running, athletics, cycling, we went into cycling first. And we also went into rugby league. Rugby league is a North of England sport. So, we were looking for white spaces. We, we called these white spaces where the, the bigger guys, the, they, they were too small, too small for them to even <coughs> worry about. And at the time, they probably didn't even know they existed, like fell running in the north of England, where fell running cross country, a lot of things that really we could, we could go into, which is great. And um, we did very well at that. We, we owned that business, which meant we were, we, we were well into the sports business. It, we knew, it, and it's a question whether were we in the shoe business or were we in the sports business? Well, we were more in the sports business than the shoe business because a lot of the people who were our competitors, you might say, local manufacturers, were in the shoe business. And if somebody said, make a pair of football boots, they'd just make the product. We were, we were with the athletes. We were part of the athletes. And we'd go to events and we would sell out to the back of the car and things like that. But I, I really thought, okay, we told my father what he needed, and he needed to get out there and s sell his product. So I thought, I'll go out there and sell the product. Off I go, calling on all these sports uh, shops. Great, here I am, meet the guy, the buyer. I'm Reebok, who's Reebok? Who's Reebok? Well, it's me, showing the product. Oh, nice product. And then he'd look up and think, look, I've got Dunlop. I've got Adidas. Why do I need Reebok? And I must have heard that a dozen times. Why do I need Reebok? So it occurred to me he didn't need Reebok. <laughs> These retailers didn't need me. They used to sell anything. They were just sports shops, usually run by an ex-footballer who just opened the store and he'd sell everything from snooker cues and chalk for your, your tip and anything that was sports. So. Uh, we were lucky. We used to go to these events, these running events, and I thought, these are my customers. I should be selling to these guys. And, well, the three A's in those days, 
the Amateur Athletic Association, they had a handbook. And every club, every running athletics club was affiliated to the three A's and there must have been 400 in this book. And we got the name and address of every secretary of every club. What do we do? A letter. <clears throat> I send a letter to every club and invite them to buy direct from us and we'll give them 15% discount. And if anybody in the club wants to become an agent, he can have the 15%. And great, I got 100 agents on that first letter. Second letter, another 50 agents. And eventually I ended, I ended with about 250 agents. That was our business. Now we were selling direct. And uh, I'm then getting phone calls from these sports stores who said, who's Reebok? And they're saying, you're selling to our local sports club. Look, I'll stock your, your product if you stop selling direct. And I said, no, I'm not stopping selling direct, but you can get it at wholesale price, which is less than 50%. And I'm sure you can give your sports club 15% because that's pretty normal discount for, for clubs. Um, about 90 of them agreed, but I did, I'm not going to stop selling direct because to us, that was our marketing. You know, that was how we got our market and uh, great. So we had a very nice business, but you know, the big business was football and we couldn't get there because Adidas really had got that sewn up. So for me, it was America. And uh, the family were not too, um, too happy to send me to America or let me go to America because that would have cost a lot of money to go there and start looking for distribution. So luckily, I'm reading a magazine, uh, Eurosport, I think it was called, and the government, the government, the British government are advertising for people to export. And they're saying, we will pay, <coughs> we, we will actually pay for a stand at the NSGA show, that's the National Sporting Goods of America, we'll pay for a stand, we will pay your return at a fair, I will also pay 50% of your, your expenditure whilst you're there. So that was it. I'm going to America. It's 1968.